Welcome to Christ Center Community on Upper Caswell Lake. May our time together learning about God and His expectations of us be a blessing to you. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy God, we humble ourselves before you. Oh, that we reflected the likeness of your Son in lieu of this world. Oh, that we would stand out by speaking truth, bathed in love as Jesus did, and not blend into this judgmental world. Please open the eyes of our hearts to be receptive to Jesus' example in this regard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We live in an age intensely concerned with image and nearly obsessed with looks. We hear more about one's appearance and skin color than we hear about one's character. One striking feature of the Gospels is that they give us no description of Jesus' appearance or the quality of his skin, but the content of his character. Particularly impressive to readers over the centuries has been what Jonathan Edwards, an American revivalist, preacher, philosopher, and Congregationalist theologian called an admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies in Jesus Christ. That is, in him we see qualities and virtues we would ordinarily consider incompatible in the same person, or we would consider contrary to common sense expectations or counterintuitive. We would never think they could be combined, but because they are, they're strikingly beautiful. Jesus combines high majesty with the greatest humility. He joins the strongest commitment to justice with astonishing mercy and grace. And he reveals a transcendent self-sufficiency and yet entire trust in and reliance upon his heavenly Father. Jesus also combines tenderness without any weakness, boldness without harshness, and humility without any uncertainty. As we read the Gospels, we can discover for ourselves Jesus' unbending convictions, but complete approachability, his insistence on truth, but always bathed in love, his power without insensitivity, integrity without rigidity, and passion without prejudice. As we continue on in our uh, sermon series titled Jesus, the Example for Us All, we'll explore one of those counterintuitive combinations. That counterintuitive combination being truth and love. One of the most counterintuitive combinations in Jesus' life was that of truth and love. It is seen everywhere in the pages of the Gospels. Then as now, people rejected and shamed those who held beliefs or practices that they thought were wrong and immoral, but not Jesus. For example, Jesus astonished everyone by being willing to eat with tax collectors who were considered collaborators with the occupying Roman imperial forces, as seen in Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, Is it not those who are healthy? who need a physician but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. This outrage at Jesus' willingness to eat with tax collectors, those we might call the left, were those who were zealous against oppression and injustice at the hands of the Romans. But then... He also welcomed a prostitute, which offended those promoting conservative traditional morality on the right, as in Luke 7, verses 36 through 
through 50. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to ask you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus deliberately and tenderly touched lepers, people who were considered physically and ceremonially contaminated, but who were desperate for human contact, as in Luke 5, Verses 12 through 13. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. Jesus also ate repeatedly with Pharisees, showing that he was not bigoted toward the bigoted. As in Luke 14, verses 1 through 6, it happened that when he went to the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent, and he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to him. Jesus forgave the enemies who were crucifying him at, uh, as in Luke 23, verses 33 to 34. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. Jesus also forgave his friends who let him down in the hour of his greatest need, as in Matthew 26, verses 40 through 43. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink of it, your will be done. 
Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. Nevertheless, though welcoming and befriending all, Jesus was surprisingly insistent on bearing witness to the truth. Zacchaeus, the despised tax collector, was stunned by Jesus' love and embrace of him. Yet, when hearing his call to repent, stopped his government-backed extortion racket, as in Luke 19, verses 1 through 9. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man caught by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. When Jesus encounters women who were considered sexually immoral by the society, he engaged them with a respect and graciousness that startled onlookers. Yet, for example, he gently points out to the Samaritan woman at the well the wreckage of her many failed relationships with men and calls her to find the sole satisfaction she has sought in him, he who is the Christ who can give her eternal life, as in John 4, 13 to 26. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up, to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And yet you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one must worship. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, that a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. And in the famous account of the woman caught in the adultery recorded in John 8 verses 1 to 11, Jesus says to her in one breath, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. In these examples, we see the counterintuitive but brilliant conjunction of both truth and love. That is, that Jesus had both a passion for justice and a commitment to mercy. 
just as is written in John 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. New Testament scholar Craig Blomberg explains that the religiously respectable of Jesus' day refused to eat or associate with people considered sinners, such as tax collectors and prostitutes, for fear of becoming morally contaminated by them. Their friendship and love was given only conditionally to those who had made themselves clean and pure. But Jesus turned the dominant social pattern on its head. He freely ate with the immoral and social outcasts. He welcomed and defended the impure and called them to follow him. He did not fear that they would contaminate him. Rather, he expected that his wholesome love would infect and change them. And again and again, this is what happened. How about you? Is your faith so weak that you're fearful of being morally contaminated by people different from yourself? For example, those who have sinned against you, those who brag all the time, those who have been in prison, those who smell funny, those who are infirmed, those who are of a different economic status, those who are addicted to alcohol and drugs, those who are in questionable professions, those of a different sexual orientation, those with different political views. As Jesus' disciples, we are called to follow his example. That is, to let our light shine and not hide it under a basket. So like Jesus, let us be, be a conjunction of diverse excellencies. Let us display the counterintuitive combinations of Jesus, especially that of truth and love. May the wholesome love of Jesus in you infect and change the lives of others. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we long to meet your expectation that we follow your example. To that end, please help us recognize and respond to others who are different from ourselves, not as the world would, but as you would, with truth bathed in love, with integrity without rigidity, and with passion for your kingdom without a prejudice that turns people off in lieu of turning them on to you. May others see you in us in everything we say and do. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. May you have a blessed week. And hopefully you can join us again for the next part of our sermon series on Jesus, the example for us all, which will be available starting next Sunday. When the time comes for God to call you home, may Jesus greet you with, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you.